Super Mario Galaxy should not be this important to me. I don't think I played it that much as a kid, or at least not nearly as much as many other games my family had on the Wii. Mario Kart, Brawl, Wii Sports, Wii Sports Resort, Mario Party 8, Super Sluggers, hell, Mario Sports Mix. A game where you kill a Final Fantasy boss with a fucking volleyball. I can only remember beating Galaxy in its sequel one time, not even completing them, and yet every time I've been reminded of it, thought back to that part of my childhood, this game has always stood out to me more than all the others. And like, why? I'm not alone here, almost everyone I ask that has played this game even a little bit seems to have such strong memories, some feeling or moment or something. So I want to look at what makes this game special, and I think the first part to this puzzle is something you might have considered before. This game is weirdly similar to Super Mario 64. Like I get they're both mainline Mario games, but just from the four games released in this time range, we can see just how different a Mario game can get. New Super Mario Bros for the DS and like all the sequels to it, which are basically the same game, we can consider a continuation of the first Super Mario Bros. Here is Mario, here are platforms, jump on and over them to get to the end of the stage. There is no such thing as immersion here. While there are distinct aesthetics to these Mario games, some more distinct than others, this isn't a world you can really get lost in. Whether it's all the blocks being on tile, the UI eternally present on the screen, or just the fact that it's 2D, the world of these games are somewhat abstracted by the aggressive video gaminess of it all. In contrast, Super Mario Sunshine throws Mario in fucking jail. Super Mario Sunshine is arguably the most fleshed out and consistent world in the entire mainline series. By mainline, I mean platformers, the RPG games don't count. The game is like weirdly consistent. The Mario franchise has had an obsession with isolated aesthetics for its entire existence. Things would be separated cleanly into worlds and subdivided into levels, all with their own distinct music, blocks, gimmicks, enemies, everything. While there are some consistent looks between games in the franchise, that isolated feeling was almost always there. Super Mario Sunshine, in comparison, is Isle Delfino. Nearly every level, from Bianco Hills to Noki Bay to Pianta Village, takes place in the same world in the story and the looks. There's a story in this game, like an honest-to-god story. There there's voice acting! This is one of the only mainline games where falling isn't the largest threat most of the time, because this game takes place on an actual planet, one that doesn't consist entirely of cliffs or an empty void below you. There are stages that resemble the older Mario titles, but they're aggressively removed from the rest of the story, with Mario going through a fucking smoke dimension to arrive at them. The music in these levels is stripped back in acapella to be simpler than its contemporaries, with the gimmick that makes the movement special to this game occasionally ripped away from you entirely. It makes a clear statement that this is not Super Mario Sunshine. This is some bonus thing added on to remind you of the old experience. Super Mario Sunshine is when your jetpack fake out dies, when Mario makes this face, when Peach says actual words, when she has a butler named Toadsworth and he's this cute little old dude. This game is the closest thing to a mainline story-based Mario to ever come out. Like, it's not a movie, it's still 95% gameplay, but Mario is jumping around a consistent world instead of a contextless one. Super Mario 64 also has a story, technically. You get a letter from Peach at the start of the game and can occasionally read signs and talk to Toads, getting actual dialogue from bosses and other NPCs. There's more personality given to these creatures that would normally be seen simply as obstacles in some of the other games. And while 64 uses that same idea of a bunch of isolated worlds aesthetically, it's all canonically linked through the hub world. These aren't levels, they're paintings, and that small change in perspective adds to the immersion of the experience. Super Mario Galaxy has a somewhat looser than sunshine, but still very real story as to why you're here and jumping around. You use a hub world to connect and fly to various different isolated galaxies, all with their own different aesthetics, collecting stars for the purpose of unlocking more and more of the station and eventually getting enough power to travel to the center of the universe to save Princess Peach. While there are star thresholds you need to meet in order to progress, you're given relative freedom in which stars you choose to get and what order you get them in. You're able to re-enter worlds multiple times for new stars, having each re-entry take you through a new iteration of the level's ideas and themes. However, what you also need to understand about Galaxy is that it's actually nothing like Super Mario 64. While the games do have many surface level similarities, 64 defined a lot of the solid baseline of what a 3D Mario game should be, while Galaxy is one of the weirdest and most experimental Mario games to ever release. And the weirdest part about it is that it's kind of hard to actually notice that fact. Let's start with the movement. Now don't kill me when I say this, but the movement in this game kind of sucks. It didn't really hit me until I replayed the game for this video, but the difference between something like Odyssey or 3D World in this game is practically an entire universe. Because it's a space game. Mario's movement at its absolute best functions a bit like learning a language. You start with these basic elements, move and jump, and start to find variations. Long jump, side jump, crouch jump, dives, kicks, ground pounds, wall jumps. You start to combine them, going from I can jump on this ledge to I can side flip into a wall jump to skip this entire section, to... 
whatever the fuck this is. Each and every level and section gets further entwined with complex movement options, becoming so natural that you hardly need to think about it. By the end of the game, you can speak this language of movement easily, shifting from consciously considering what to do to gauging your odds of being able to pull it off. With thousands and thousands of hours, speedrunners become fluent, the game's movement being as much of an extension of themselves as their actual native language. In fact, maybe even better considering some of the shit I've seen them pull off. The best Mario game at this sort of feeling, in my opinion, is Odyssey. While movement options are somewhat tame in other games most of the time, as varied as their default movements are, the addition of the hat in Odyssey was done for the explicit purpose of movement combinations. It's so easy to flow with it that I'd honestly call it broken, but the focus of the game is so strongly around movement and collection instead of intense challenge that it only serves to better the experience. The high of mastering this language enough to just bypass the actual intended level design is not something to sneeze at, it's super fun. Not only is it an open world in terms is the map design, it's an open world in how you can choose to traverse it. In comparison, Super Mario Galaxy is kinda... The idea of combining moves in Super Mario Galaxy is practically non-existent. The closest thing is chaining together long jumps, but it's made actively difficult to do so, needing to wait a bit if you want to change your direction at all. And even then, this movement is hardly useful for more than two long jumps in a row without you knowing the route ahead of time. Half of your moveset seems to kill all of your forward momentum when you land, as well as almost any sudden change in direction, with every maneuver having more startup and end lag, making it far harder to recover from mistakes. While Sunshine speedruns are a constant barrage of complicated movement patterns, insane tricks, and game-breaking glitches, the world record run of Super Mario Galaxy 1, while impressive, doesn't look nearly as flashy. The fastest way to move around is often just running with no other tricks because the gravity of the smaller planets punishes jumping, with the rest of the run mostly consisting of long jumps. The skill expressed in the game is not through intense precision inputs, but rather reliability, taking all these pretty unwieldy movement options and managing to nail it every single time. You can't push the game's movement too hard because it actively rejects the idea of doing so. The unique movement option added to Mario's repertoire in this game is a spin attack, given with the help of a Luma. While it is a helpful movement option, the only time where it actually adds to a move is when you're going upwards, making vertical movement often easier and faster than horizontal in this game. The main purpose it actually serves to platforming is not as a way to combine and follow up on movements, but to correct mistakes. While it does lift you higher, it also cancels all lateral momentum and is often the only move you can do to interrupt the last one you made. It's an eraser, a way to correct over jumping or incorrect inputs, and it turns even this galaxy-specific unique movement option into something methodical. The movement in this game is a matter of step-by-step -step careful planning, and as such, placing the majority of the way you express skill and how you deal with the level itself. If there's one word to define Super Mario Galaxy's level design, it's linear. Many galaxies consist of defined objective after objective, many requiring platforming but only to serve that eventual unrelated goal. Almost every level in the game is a sort of predefined roller coaster, with set movements and ideas and executions of them. In Super Mario 64, you're told that a star is here, and to get to it in any way you can in order to win. In Super Mario Galaxy, you're given a checklist of tasks to do before you earn the right to get to that final planet. One of the more interesting consequences of this linear design philosophy, to me, focuses around the idea of universal rules. When it comes to mechanics in games, there are ones that always work and ones that are situation specific. This is a painfully simplistic example, but generally, if something is not a wall or a ceiling, you're assumed to be able to walk on it unless indicated otherwise. This sounds stupid until you realize that almost every single video game's world design tries desperately to avoid the land angles of roughly 45 degrees to 75 degrees. That zone, unless the movement of the game is specifically designed around it, is actively avoided because it confuses the well-defined concepts of ground and wall. Elden Ring has as many cliffs as it does for a good reason. Changes in elevation are either gradual or immediate, so the player is never confused on where they can or cannot walk. If you ignore this rule, suddenly you have horses that can climb mountains. In games focused strongly around movement, the decoration you build around your environment that's not meant to be used can sometimes be confusing, because to make it always distinctly different from the game's main path might break immersion. And so, developers often need to solve this conflict between functionality and looks in a number of ways. One of the most common ones is the equivalent of just throwing your hands up and saying I quit, giving the player a button that just tells them these are the important things you need to be looking at right now. Mirror's Edge is a bit more stylistic about it, integrating the important object button just into the game's aesthetic, coloring every potentially useful or specialized object as red so you don't try spring jumping off of every random crate you see. Mario games, being far more cartoonish, are able to get away with smoothly integrating this idea of universal rules into their games. In most mainline Mario games, the most important set of universal mechanics is Mario's movement. Games like 3D World are so beholden to it that every level unambiguously caters itself to this idea. There's not a moment where you could possibly mistake a wall for a floor. 
The game is just stunningly right-angled, every curve making absolutely sure not to compromise the player's immediate understanding. If you stripped away the textures and compared it to the game's hitboxes, it would be practically indistinguishable. The function comes first, and the form follows after. Even for the more story-based Marios, this trend is hardly different. While there will be walls you can't jump off of or over, it's communicated as clearly as it can be to the player. While 64 can just kind of get away with everything being flat and jumpable because of the polygonal time it was made, Sunshine has more freedom for detail and, in a strange way, more restriction as a result. Like the 45 degree angle rule, if a wall was jumpable in Sunshine, it had to be near absolutely flat and if it wasn't meant to be jumpable, it had to be noticeably bumpy. There was a zone of texture that just couldn't really be put into the game, as it would be too confusing for players and would dampen the experience, one that relies so heavily on movement to be gratifying. Feeding even deeper into the lack of emphasis on movement for Galaxy, sometimes you just can't jump off of things, and sometimes you can. One of the worst examples to me is buoy based Galaxy, specifically the star at the Floating Fortress. Now, the objective of this star seems to be one of the more open in the game. There are some galaxies that give you a simple task of collecting five silver stars around a large area, and this one has something similar, needing to ascend the tower while collecting five blue star pieces that bring you to the next planet. On the way up the tower, it gives off the feeling of being somewhat open, in the same way that something like Sea Slide Galaxy is, but then you get to this little pit area. There are two screws that you need to spin in, one to spawn a spring enemy and one to start rotating the cannon platforms. Now, the developers noticed that these walls are not nearly high enough to make it impossible to climb up them, but the spring enemy didn't launch you enough to clear a wall that you can't just scale normally. And so, the developers decided, you just can't jump off of these walls. The universal rule of jumping off of flat walls, something you can do for every other wall on this tower, is broken just to force you to bounce off of this one spring enemy. Oh, and it didn't even work, you can just triple jump and make it easily. All of this is to say, that when it comes to the decision of form versus function in Super Mario Galaxy, between the looks and the gameplay, the looks come first. A wall can be kind of scraggly looking and weird and you can still jump off of it, and vice versa, because like, why not? They wanted it to look good, I guess. And honestly, who could blame them? And so, okay, knowing all of this, why do Comet Stars exist? This is one of the most confusing decisions in this entire video game. As much as I've talked about the de-emphasized movement, I want to be clear that for what the game is going for, the movement helps that experience most of the time. It has a way of making you laser your focus on every tiny aspect of the level, since you can't just movement bullshit spam your way out of a bad situation. If you bonk a wall, there's like a 20% chance you instantly die via black hole. However, occasionally, a comet will visit a galaxy you've already beaten. These comet stars will take the already existing galaxy and direct all the focus onto the gameplay itself. Itself. Sometimes this means needing to beat a boss without getting hit, which is hit or miss. However, other times it's done in the form of a level timer or a race against Shadow Mario. And some of those times, I want to rip all of my hair out. The combat for Sea Slide Galaxy is a race against Shadow Mario and it's piss easy. You grab a shell, Shadow Mario just jumps on the land for no reason, you climb out of the water, dead simple. Except, I lost this challenge three times because I couldn't enter the water correctly. I died 20 or so times total on the way to Bowser, the first 60 stars of this game. This level level did not deserve to be 15% of that. The swimming mechanics are tolerable when there isn't a race to the death, but once all the video game is placed on scrutinizing the controls, it falls apart entirely. If they didn't make Shadow Mario a bumbling idiot, I'm pretty sure this level alone would send children into crying fits. Not all of the comments are bad, to be clear. The game's difficulty is at its best when it plays into designing the level around it instead of just shoehorning it into an already existing one, but there are comments that do one simple change to the level itself. The fast foe comments make all the enemies faster on one planet, turning the difficulty up enough to be fun and placing the challenge still on the level itself. But ultimately, it's not the challenge that people remember about the game. In my opinion, the thing that makes Galaxy so memorable is also the main selling point of the game, Nintendo's aesthetic of space. Or, more accurately, that Super Mario Galaxy is not a space game. Well, it's kind of a space game, but not like the space games we normally think of. Space and the night sky, to humanity, has long represented the future, the idea of expanding outwards beyond our planet into the great unknown. And so, when a game is set in space, that is a major committal decision for what this game is going to feel like and have in it. Not only does sci-fi almost always imply the existence of space travel, but the space aesthetic being in a video game almost always implies that it will be sci-fi. Galaxy, however, just doesn't really do that. The Mario series as a whole, while there is most certainly futuristic technology, somehow always maintains a magical feeling to it. While this kind of feels weird to say, the Mario universe clearly has magic in it, and it feels weird to say that because it's so natural to the series. 
These days, when magic is used in fiction, it's almost always given some sort of logic to it. If magic can just kinda happen without consequence, the stakes of a story can't really be well established. It needs to have rules and limits, otherwise it all kind of feels like bullshit, it's meaningless. However, in a world with so little requisite logic as to how it works, half the time not even trying to be immersive, magic can be treated like it used to. It's some force that pervades the world, an extension of nature that causes and creates and animates things we don't and cannot understand. Why can Mario eat a flower and throw fireballs? Fucking magic, I don't know. And even in Nintendo's approach to technology, it refuses to limit itself to some series of logical decisions. Machines are given sentient life, or are designed to suck up ghosts through unknown means, or are fucking super cannons that create darkness zones. Even the things explicitly designed to be technology are sourced from the natural extension of the magic of this world around us. Super Mario Galaxy is a space-centered game that works through magic instead of science. The way space used to be, representing a feeling of wonder instead of something to be solved. And this sort of feeling over function helps the game get away with just a ridiculous amount of weirdness. Canonically, in the game, the planets and stars you jump on and around are all formed by Lumas, the little baby stars that help you and Rosalina all throughout your journey. And while most of the planets turn out to be kinda normal-ish, many others are just plain ridiculous. I mean, there's a star where you just jump on a 2D Mario. How do they even know about that? Did they ask? Who did they ask? Miyamoto? Is he in the Super Mario Galaxy? The pure extreme variety of how aesthetically sound or dissonant a galaxy can be in this game is just plain ridiculous. Some are just a simple embrace of the space aesthetic. The first galaxy in the game outside of the intro, Good Egg Galaxy, is a perfect example of this. You land on a little planet with a house on one side and a castle on the opposite half. Once you get accustomed to some of the weird gravity, you're sent off to a pear-shaped grassy planet with spikes. Next is the scraggly egg-shaped rock. Next is a literal Yoshi egg in the form of a planet. Each of these do have a distinct aesthetic to them, but they're overpowered by the feeling of the sky behind them. All of these planets too, while in actuality being completely linear in the way that you take them, sell the illusion of adventure by letting you just see them everywhere at all times. I mentioned this in a previous video, but that sort of launching from planet to planet via launch star is hardly different from pipes in other Mario games. The functional purpose is to bring you from predefined point A to predefined point B, but the presentation alone makes it feel so satisfying to do. Instead of a straight line, it's a bunch of tiny planets scattered in orbit, and that decision adds a lot to the experience. Other galaxies are deeply engrossed in a theme, not unlike the paintings of Super Mario 64. In fact, often so dedicated to that theme that it feels like the game forgets that it's about space entirely. Dusty Dune Galaxy, it, it, it's, it's just a desert level. The sky is clear blue, the sand is yellowish gray, there's pyramids and cacti, it's just a classic desert level. There are things floating in the air, but that's just a thing that platformers do sometimes. Even the music is actively unspacey. It's almost a break from the formula, this game's reminder of earlier entries to the series. Others, and perhaps the most memorable ones to me, are the levels that take that space feeling and color it with its own defined look. Battle Rock Galaxy is just this fucking mammoth of a space station, dropping you into the level with a direct view of just how it is. You feel so small, subject to this battery of artillery in one of the few places outside of the Grand Star levels that feels built by things other than Lumas. In fact, it feels like it tried to kill any Luma the station sees on site. Rather than a bunch of tiny planets loosely connected, it feels like one big thing that other small things surround. In Battle Rock 2, the game commits more than ever to what I think is one of its greatest strengths, a commitment to being cinematic. Super Mario Galaxy, more than any other mainline Mario game, has a fascination with always looking good. Learning from some of the painful camera issues present in Super Mario 64, Galaxy often takes complete control of the camera for you. While there are levels that serve as semi-open world collectathons, on almost every planet, star, and system, the camera is pre-rigged to be exactly what the developers want you to see. While this was presumably done in part to make the whole experience more convenient, especially with all the changing angles due to gravity, it was also done just to make the game look better. So long as it didn't have to sacrifice functionality too much, so many planets in this game used forced perspective to focus on looking dangerous or awe-inspiring or epic. Now that it was taken outside of the control of the player, the camera was given the ability to contribute to the actual tone and feeling of the game. Forced perspective also allows the game to seamlessly change between different kinds of platforming entirely. In a moment's notice, from something as defined as launching to a new planet to something as simple as walking forward, Galaxy can switch from 3D to 2D, or weird 2D, or top down. It can use perspective to hide secrets or direct you to the next area, even things as subtle as aligning the camera to work well with controller notch inputs. Every facet of Super Mario Galaxy, from its controls to its level design to its camera work, all trade player input for the sake of curating one specific experience. 
Nowadays, and even back when Galaxy was released, one of the biggest buzzwords in video game marketing was open. Freedom of movement, freedom of creation, of skill expression, of environmental design. Openness in games can be amazing, and some of the greatest works of all time in this medium are the ones that embrace that philosophy. But what Galaxy reminded me of is that sometimes, the more control you give to a developer, to their vision, the more room they have to give you an unforgettable experience. Every single level is composed of cinematic moments, fun combat, creative decision making, endless variety, and the linear packaging only serves to better that experience. The experience of adventure, of scale, of excitement, and most importantly, of progression. Throughout the game, while you have the freedom of choice of what levels you want to play, you're softly gated by the Bowser levels. After each completion, you unlock a new section of the station, and with it, a new observatory. While level to level it doesn't feel like much is changing, there's a subtle progression in how everything develops. While I talked about the sort of meek, entirely space-themed levels, those only seem to exist for the first few observatories. As the game continues, maybe counterintuitively, the galaxies seem to focus less and less on the idea of space. By the time you reach the second half of the game, any stage with a strong space atmosphere isn't without its own twist on it, defining every individual stage as something unique and uncompromising. The final Bowser stage, the one at the center of the universe, is not actually in an observatory. However, the final grand star still unlocks one last part of the station. Every new observatory unlocked seems to get further and further away from the start of the hub area. Every time you're brought back to talk to Rosalina or start up the game again, you need to travel all the way back to these later game spots, making each one feel literally and symbolically distant from the game you were first introduced to. The final observatory, the one that's entirely optional, having no Bowser stage at all, is positioned at the very peak of the station. And while everyone before this was a basic building, getting more and more thematic, this is not a building at all. You're met with this impossible open landscape, being literally on a planet of some kind similar to our own, and yet somehow feeling like the most alien part of this video game so far. And to match it, the galaxies in this observatory keep that intensely alien feeling. Dreadnought Galaxy is Battle Rock taken to the extreme, being this massive, imposing space station entirely removed from the more naturalistic feeling of the game. Every star takes you to new sections of this station, climbing and dodging and jumping through barrages of enemies and ammo. Every star starts you away from the station itself, letting you soak in the size of it before being shown some relatively small yet massive piece, knowing that no matter how many stars were placed here, you'd never feel like you explored it all. Matter Splatter Galaxy uses this dark matter mechanic seen in some of the Bowser levels, but in reverse, delivered through beams of light pinging off the invisible ground. Instead of a space or sky, you're accompanied by a strange green, and then soon after, a pitch black void. You can see the green skybox disappear as you pipe to the next area, all notions of immersion or flight or adventure being actively deconstructed in front of you. It feels like the dark matter has dissolved the presentation of the game itself, leaving you a much rawer version of what this game actually is. A bunch of things floating in a literal void. Deep Dark Galaxy is the closest thing to embracing an open world philosophy, with the entire level being one continuous route through beaches, caverns, and water. Each star is so cohesive that it's borderline off-putting, being so conditioned by the rest of the game that it feels like I'm playing an entirely different one. In a game where space represents the magical unknown, the most awe-inspiring discoveries come not through the most space-like places, but rather through the strangest things it has to offer. Every secret in this game feels so genuinely alien, the trial galaxies being unlocked after finding all three green stars, each level exploring some niche mechanic as much as it can. Returning to the homeworld just before the final observatory and being given the power of flight around the station, things that aren't traditionally gratifying for games, but are deeply fulfilling for the mystique the game offers you. Only space could have things so strange, and each discovery makes it feel more and more like anything is possible here. There were so many days as a kid where I'd religiously watch Super Mario Galaxy's secret compilations instead of actually playing the game myself. I'd search for glitches and skips and easter eggs, falling for hoaxes and jump scare videos made for other kids exactly like me. I wanted to see everything this game had, intentional or otherwise. However, there was one thing, one aspect of the game that, as a kid, I was never really interested in. The library. But first, strange question. What, like, happens in this game? I've spent about, what, 25 minutes just talking about the game, but things do happen in the game, in the plot, and yet it's surprisingly normal for the most part. Well, certainly more cinematic in its execution than normal. The main story of Super Mario Galaxy is the same save Peach from Bowser structure that basically every mainline Mario game has. When it comes to most video games with a story, it's integrated alongside or between gameplay sections to serve as a reward or to give actual meaning as to what you're doing in the game. Mario games are some of the most bare-bones examples of this most of the time. Peach gone, find Peach. Get to the end, beat Bowser, get Peach day saved. 
At the end of every chapter in Boss Fight, you find out that, oh no, Peach isn't here, and every time you fail to save her makes the eventual victory feel better. They serve as gentle encouragements to keep going, that if you kicked Bowser's ass this time, you can do it again, and eventually it will be the last one. The pure barebonesness of these stories place all the focus back on the game without making the player feel like something's missing. Even Sunshine, while fleshing out the world significantly more, ultimately adopts this sort of setup, just in a more complicated way. Galaxy swaps between Bowser and Bowser Jr., with Jr. giving you more creative fights while the real deal gives you a weighty, genuinely pretty fun fight that gets increasingly complex with every new iteration. And yet, still, the story is just very simple. You know, until a fucking black hole destroys everything! The interesting parts of the story, the most notable ones, all center around Rosalina and the Lumas. You don't really talk to Rosalina much outside of the beginning and end of the game, mostly being given small updates on how you're doing in her sort of gentle tone, and yet there are brief moments where you do get to peer in sight of who she and the Lumas are. Lumas are repeatedly referred to as children, they're these squishy, carefree, kind of stupid little dudes, and their form of maturity is to become a piece of this universe. When they do transform, it's done almost exclusively to help people, and can be done in the form of planets, launch stars, power stars, and presumably even more things we don't even know about. That's to say that these Lumas, in some way, depict the unformed universe itself, and that what the universe is made of is not only inherently kind, but helpful and optimistic. The land wants to foster life, the stars want to help power the station, the launch stars want to help you travel. Every single thing in the universe is screaming out for goodness and happiness and light. Rosalina is the mother of these children, but even then, she emanates that same sort of innocence. The library is a completely optional room in the Comet Observatory, one whose only purpose is for Rosalina to read a story to the Lumas. This story, as we come to find out, is actually Rosalina's backstory in the form of a children's storybook. Mario games have long been tied to the framing of storybooks, feeding into that idea of childhood innocence, but the content presented has only ever been an intro or a way to frame the video game itself. The sequel, in fact, is framed in this exact way, but the original isn't. For all intents and purposes, Super Mario Galaxy is not a story being told, but its own entire universe, and this story, Rosalina's book, is one that exists entirely within it. It details the journey of a young girl who finds a Luma one day, one who's waiting for their mother. The writing of the story is actively childish, in technique and in logic. Things like waiting for years or forgetting water are treated as mild inconveniences, not understanding the actual scale and severity of things. Cute and silly concepts like butterfly nets being essential are stated with blunt upfront confidence. Furniture and building supplies come out from the middle of comets. This logic only makes sense to a child, and yet simultaneously, this is Rosalina's backstory. While this is certainly childish even for this world, this logic makes sense because this is a story written in the Mario universe. While every one of us grows up, there's always some part within us that remains a child, and these games have a way of immersing us in it. The presentation and writing and stakes are plainly simplistic, logical leaps are easily accepted as fact, it stays silly and light-hearted in the face of real and scary stakes. The story of Rosalina is one that's entirely optional to engage with, it's not a motivator to keep playing or even really a reward in my opinion, at least not a traditional one. It's something that we, the player, choose to engage with. It's calm, antithetical to the rest of the game, an active break from that action and tailored experience. And yet, simultaneously, it's this feeling that pervades every Mario game condensed into one story. It not only evokes that inner child, but speaks directly to it. While the majority of Rosalina's book is fairly normal, being an escapist journey into the stars, it starts to play around with the idea that it's not that simple. The Luma never finds their original mother, the comet never comes, and as a result, Rosalina takes them under her own protection. And soon after, takes every Luma she meets under her wing. While not said explicitly at first, Rosalina wanted to travel the stars too, in search of her own mother. Before she disappeared, she told Rosalina that she'll always be watching over her, and Rosalina chose to take it literally. However, in the middle of this lulling journey, she takes a look back at her home planet, back to the hill she'd stargaze with, and breaks down in tears. She knew what her mother meant, but didn't want to consider it. This journey wasn't just to help the Luma, but to escape one harsh reality. Her mother is sleeping under the tree, on that hill. Even at its darkest moment, the story doesn't leave that childish mindset, that way of writing and thinking. And because of that, the reader, the reader's inner child, has no reason to shy away, no defense to put up. It's still so gentle, while being so painfully sad. Eventually, we see Rosalina take up the role of Mother of the Lumas, by extension in some way the Mother of the Universe, but never abandoning that purity. 
While she has matured over hundreds of years, she continues to reflect this entire game around us. In a way, we're adventuring within her innocence, her wonder, her universe. In a game that de-emphasizes the role of Mario, putting first the world around him, what truly sets this game apart from the rest of the mainline titles is that the world is represented entirely by someone that isn't him. I've seen a lot of people boil down what makes this game memorable just to this storybook, and while it does change the way you look at the rest of the game, it simply could not exist without everything else. The cinematics, the level design, the aesthetics, all of it is tailored to bring you to this state of mind. To immerse you in a world where the story doesn't just make sense, but means something. While the individual parts of this game might fade, the planets, the levels, the movements, the power-ups, the story, even the music, the background never seems to dissipate. The details can and will disappear as time stretches on, but what's left after everything is gone is the thing that sticks most with us. Gazing wistfully into an endless night sky. Did you know that I make videos that aren't even on this channel? As appreciative as I am of YouTube and my job on it, there are so many niche topics and ideas that I just can't make into a main channel video. Most times they're too short, but other times they just wouldn't work with the YouTube algorithm. Like a mini essay about the rock of the YouTube sphere and needing to make fresh content for years about a game that has a single 5 minute gameplay loop is not going to appeal to everyone. So lucky for me, I've recently become a member of the streaming service Nebula. Now Nebula is a service that lets me and nearly 200 other creators I respect not just upload their stuff completely ad free, but upload bonus segments of videos and completely exclusive content just for the site. And not only have I recently joined, but Nebula has been getting more and more gaming creators. From Jake Jacob Geller to Rasputin to Game Maker's Toolkit and more. Speaking of bonus content, there was a segment to the script of this video that I found very interesting about Super Mario Galaxy 2 and the infinite Yoshi flutter jump, but there was no one spot where it could really fit in and not heavily break up the flow of the video. And so, I turned that segment into its own little bonus video on Nebula. As of the release of this video, there's five standalone mini-essays about everything from the worst video game tutorial I've ever seen to OK Go and viral YouTube music video artists. So if you want more of my stuff, as well as nearly 200 other channels worth of bonus and exclusive content completely ad-free, use my link in the description below or on screen to join for just $2.50 a month. It's so worth it, like genuinely. I use Nebula so much it's crazy. And for the holiday season, there's a deal where you can just buy Nebula for life if you want to, for 300 bucks. They're offering the deal so that Nebula has money to fund a bunch of major projects for 2024, so if you want to fund some big documentaries and get a great service for life in the process, this is the deal for you. Anyways, I hope to see you on Nebula, and now it's time for patrons. I, ca I cannot find my, my member page. How do I see my members? Okay, so I literally cannot sort by tiers anymore, so I'm gonna have to, like, do this just in a random order. Uh, thank you to Jericho, Zimborg, Wallace to Morinville, Wicked Wannabe, <laughs> Owen, Arkin Atlan, Dankly Voidly, Grinkle Stinkle, MF Bitch Boy, Brody Larson, Edmund Dong, uh, Florian, Stickman Mayhem, Thomas Scott, Seven Syringe, Connor, Big Dave, Ro Ramden, Brian Jackson, Undersea Rex EVT, Ted H, A Magic Muffin, No Joke, Maiden Batter, Robin Michael Becker, Bestest Patron, Glugglejug, Jug, and Ribbon Aster. And if I miss one of you, I'm truly sorry. I, I, I don't know why they changed the website like this. I cannot sort by tears anymore. Uh, anyways, I hope you all have a nice day. Uh, and... Do you like Atlas? He's my turtle.